and welcome to North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, one of the civic partners for our show. Today I have Kathleen Stein, who's the president of the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, in the studio with me. And Kathy, welcome so much to North Country Matters. Great to be here. This is uh, a, a great uh, opportunity for us to talk about all of the new voting laws that have been enacted and some of the ones that are in the process of being enacted uh, and how they're going to affect elections this very year. So just as a little bit of a history lesson, let's tell you that the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 by Carrie Chapman Catt and it was during a convention of the National American Woman Suffrage Association and the convention was held just six months before the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was ratified by the U.S. Constitution. Now those early suffragettes, after spending 72 years working on getting the vote, were <laughs> determined that uh, when women were actually able to go to the polls that they would be fully engaged citizens, which is uh, of course what you want when that happens. And the local league started here in 1920 uh, in St. Lawrence County with local leagues in Canton, Potsdam, and Augensburg. And from the beginning, the purpose of those organizations was to educate all voters, men and women alike. So the St. Lawrence County League went until the early 2000s mm -hmm. uh, in a continuous mode. It took a little break for a few years because of some leadership problems and things like that. But, you know, that's often the case with an organization. They go through those kinds of, that kind of turmoil. Exactly. So in 2008, people were ready to step forward and revitalize the league. And Kathy, you were one of those leaders. So tell us what made you think 2008 was the time to get the league going again here in the county. Well, it seemed like, you know, um, a lot of energy around the presidential election at that time, but also a lot of rancor. Um, little did we know how rancorous it could get. But it, so it seemed like a time when we wanted more civil, civic discourse. And the League certainly has always represented that. It's a nonpartisan organization. We don't uh, endorse any candidates or any parties. And uh, so it just it, it seemed like the time, and other people like yourself uh, thought so as well. And so, you know, we, we got it going again. Right. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that the League, along with the other so-called Googles, which are the good government organizations here in New York <laughs> State, have been working on for years and years is to modernize and reform New York State's voting laws. Tell us, Kathy, a little bit about why those reforms have been so sorely needed for so many years. So sorely needed. Um, well, New York has had uh, one of the poorest turnouts, historically, uh, of states. Um, and part of the reason is that we haven't had any early voting. 38 other states in the District of Columbia have had early voting. Um, we have very restrictive absentee ballot provisions. We only certain reasons, you know, can you get a uh, vote absentee. Um, you know, cumbersome restrictions on, on registering to vote. If you move within the state, you've had to completely re-register. Um, you know, who can vote in primaries? You have to be registered in the party, and then we make it hard, and still make it hard to change your registration. Um, so, you know, I mean, we just, you know, many things that have, have, have helped suppress our voting uh, turnout, and so, you know, we need reform. <laughs> and um, this year, uh, with the change in the makeup of the New York State Senate, of course the New York State Assembly has for years voted for reform, mm -hmm. but those bills went to the New York Senate to die. Yes. So this year, <laughs> in a word, yes. <laughs> this year they did not die, they actually got acted on. So let's take a, a few minutes here to go through some of the new laws that will actually govern the way elections are run here in New York State starting in 2019 this, this year. So one of the things is early voting. So that is a huge uh, step forward, isn't it? It is, it is. Um, so there will be, uh, t starting 10 days before the election, um, early voting, and, and I won't go into all the details, but there will be some evening hours, there will be some hours on weekends, um, and it will go up through the Sunday uh, before the election, and then there will still be voting on election day. 
Right, and so for 2019, that first day to start early voting will actually be October 27th. So uh, that will make a big difference in terms of poll accessibility for a lot of folks yes. who, who can't get time off to vote or who are uh, working in one place but have to vote in another place and may not have time to get back to their, poll, their regular po uh, polling place. Another uh, reform this year, and something that's actually going to save money, is primary consolidation. So let's chat a little bit about how that's going to work, Kathy. Yes, well, and this has been one of the things that has suppressed the vote in New York, is that we can have three different primary dates, and people cannot keep track of them. They, you know, they may get interested in one and then not realize that there are more primaries. Uh, and of course, it's very expensive for counties. And so now we're going to have one date. It's going to be in um, June, the fourth Tuesday in June. All the primaries together, much simpler. Right, and that would include um, that would include congressional candidates if it's a congressional year. Yep. That would include any of your state and local offices. And uh, that's going to be the only thing that will probably still require a separate primary date is a primary for president every four years because I'm not sure that. New York is quite ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That might be too even too much even for you know this reformist moment here. <laughs> so one of the things that New York State has done is they have created pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, which, other than for um, 18 year olds who are going to turn uh, 18 just ahead of uh, that time period, just ahead of election day. This is big because it gives us a chance to really outreach to young people, doesn't it? Yes, yes, and for the league, you know, we're, we're, we're very happy about that, that it will help us uh, to, to get people, you know, young people thinking about voting even before they actually can, and they're going to revise the, uh, the form so there'll be a, a pending, uh, you know, section there that, that will be marked, and, and then as soon as they turn 18, they will, uh, you know, the registration will be become automatically complete. And one of the things that we saw for the 2018 election is that young people really were engaged this last year for the congressional elections. In several states, uh, they turned out in, in surprisingly high numbers. And that kind of momentum is something that we hope going forward they will continue to stay engaged because actually that generation is going to be much larger than the boomer generation which mm -hmm. up until recently has been the largest voting generation so they need to get engaged early and they need to stay engaged because the issues that uh, their federal and state lawmakers are looking at are things that are going to affect them for their entire lifetimes. Exactly, exactly. So uh, another um, reform uh, which is really important is the statewide voter registration transfer and you alluded a little bit to that earlier mm -hmm. yeah so you know as it is now uh, you move in the state you have to completely re-register um, this will will there will be a state voter list and that will be you know that every voter uh, you know every board of elections can check uh, their their you know registration against and so even if somebody has moved recently um, they can vote by affidavit and then the, the local board of elections can simply check the state list and say ah yes this person is registered they just haven't changed their address here uh, we'll do that and you know good to go so you don't have people you know forced to miss elections because they forgot to fill out the form again. Or they moved in within the time frame that it was yes. uh, allowable to register to vote in the first place and mm -hmm. that, that they would be cut out. You know, one of the things this is going to entail, obviously, for something like this is a, a lot of education on the part of our poll workers. Yes, At yes. the county levels because counties are in charge of elections. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that is going to be one of the... Uh, you know, one of the things that the, the hurdles that it will have to be exactly. to make this all work. And and the last of the five early voting measures that was passed and signed into law for this year is the closure of what's known as the LLC loophole, which mm -hmm. is actually a campaign financing issue, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And it and it has enabled corporations to channel almost unlimited sums of money uh, into political campaigns without you know their their fingerprints showing on it um, now there will have to be uh, you know uh, revealing there will be a limit on the on the dollar amount and also revealing of who uh, who exactly is the controlling interest in these uh, limited liability companies right so there are two other reforms that 
have, the process has started this year, but because they require a constitutional amendment, it's actually going to be a couple of years before we see these come into effect. One is same-day voter registration, and the other is no excuse absentee balloting or voting, which we talked about a little bit before. Currently in New York, you have to be registered 25 days before Election Day in order to qualify to vote. And with the no excuse absentee voting, there are six reasons, official accepted mm -hmm. reasons, that you can mm -hmm. uh, vote by absentee ballot in New York State. And this change would take away those and make it a no excuse absentee voting. So in order to do that, um, it's a constitutional amendment has to be passed in New York State. So tell us a little bit about those, Kathy. Yeah, and, and you know, this is a procedure, you know, that, that the legislative procedure for um, making a change to the New York Constitution. So these both laws have passed in this, um, in this leg legislature. They must pass again in the exact same form, same wording, uh, in the next legislature, which is to say in 2020. Um, and if they do that, then in, in 2021, they will uh, be subject to re public referendum. They'll be on the ballot as, as two you know, separate referenda. And if they pass that public vote, then they become law. So 2022, 2022. would be the first time that right. both of these reforms would go into effect. Right. And th these are going to be huge in terms of voter access to the polls because mm -hmm. it will mean that people really will be able to engage at a later time yes. than they have, they're forced to engage now when they want to vote. Mm -hmm. So, so with any luck, uh, those will those will pass the public referendum part of it, and yes. they will be they will be law. Now, these reforms are long overdue, and uh, we certainly look forward as a league to making voting in New York State less burdensome, but. There's always the caveat that these reforms are going to cost money, mm -hmm. and county boards of elections, which oversee elections, have to work hard to get everything in place before the first primary date here in 2019 in order to make that happen. So let's talk a little bit about money. <laughs> there have been some, some pretty divergent estimates about what these reforms might cost. Uh, what are you hearing in terms of estimates, Kathy? Well, the, the League of Women Voters um, you know, put together a, a quick estimate um, and uh, a 9.3 million dollars now this is really mostly talking about the uh, the yearly expenses and this is statewide this is not per per county but statewide um, and things like um, you know renting the additional polling places um, you know paying additional poll workers um, you know um, security for the polling places and and, and that kind of thing and this is for the early voting part right, right for the right. early voting because that is really going to be the be the most expensive part um, just last week citizen Union released uh, what I think is a more realistic uh, estimate of 49.5 million dollars over the next 10 years now a lot of that is going to be um, the upfront costs particularly for uh, getting uh, electronic poll books because to, to have really efficient early voting you need the electronic poll books and that is a big expense but it's it's basically a one-time expense um, so uh, and and you know as we have said you know particularly with the con primary consolidation that will be a considerable savings for counties but it's not going to be realized <laughs> right away uh, so um, you know that we really really need to have um, money from the state level to come down to help the counties to deal with these. And that costs. has to be up front and it has yes. to be pretty quickly because um, yes. it needs to be in place before they start uh, the primary uh, season. Right. So right. Uh, that is the thing. Now one concern has been that the governor did not dedicate any voting reform money in the New York State budget proposals that he made last month. County boards of elections uh, uh, are concerned about that, and as well they, they should be. What's the league's position on, on funding, Kathy? That the state must help the counties. Um, we, I mean, these reforms are so important and so long uh, fought for uh, that we cannot let them be an unfunded mandate. There are enough unfunded mandates for the counties, and St. Lawrence County in particular is, is, is one of the poorer counties in the state. So. And being physically large, we also have an awful lot of polling places, so that just multiplies the cost. That's right, and and even though the early voting 
um, you know, is, is an, not every single polling place is going to be open for early voting. I mean, um, probably in St. Lawrence County, we might have just as few as, as two polling places. But even so, um, you know, there's still additional expenses uh, for that, and the electronic poll books, which I think every county is going to uh, need to do. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we are, um, you know, the league is already lobbying for additional, uh, for money to be in the uh, state budget. And all local leagues have been asked to meet with uh, their boards of election. And in fact, we will be meeting with the St. Lawrence County Board of Election next week. Um, and uh, we've already, you know, been in touch with both, uh, you know, commissioners. And they are very eager to talk to us. <laughs> um, and because the state league wants the input, the local input about the different problems, because obviously urban counties are going to have different problems than you know county like yeah. like we are going to have. Um, they want uh, the input from all over the state to use in their lobbying efforts mm -hmm. down in Albany. So uh, yeah, no, the league we appreciate the money side of this. Right. And and another uh, thought about the electronic poll books when. Those are going to be really critical for uh, early voting because you're not going to carry every single district's poll book to an early voting site, which may take in half the county geographically. Yeah, right. Just to go through those paper books would be a nightmare, to say the least. Yes. And the other thing is um, about when it gets to be time to um, have people who have, not, who have moved but not re-registered it's going to be hard to find their original uh, registration forms if we don't Impossible. have the electronic statewide polling. So, right, right. so that there's a lot of reasons why that reform is going to cost some money and is is a good thing to fund up front. Yes. Yes. Okay. So in 2019, it's an it's what they call an off year election. There is no congressional uh, seats, and in this case, there's no statewide seats other uh, either that are on the ballot. But 2019 is a very, very important year uh, for county and, and local elections all across the state. So what elected positions are on the ballot here in St. Lawrence County this year? Well, we've got um, county clerk, mm -hmm. uh, county sheriff, and um, we already have candidates announced for those mm -hmm. positions. And there are numerous on the, uh, this, the uh, County Board of Elections website has a full list. I mean, there are uh, town village positions including mayors, trustees, supervisors, town council, clerks, highway superintendents. I mean, there's a lot of local elections going to be happening. So, and, and at the county level with the county sheriff and with the county clerk, those are both going to be, uh, that the people that are there now are retiring. So those are open seats which can really uh, generate a lot of interest mm -hmm. in a, an election when there isn't an incumbent who is likely to to win. So there could be a lot of uh, there could be a lot of interest in those two positions in particular. Yes, a yes. lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. So the St. Lawrence County Board of Elections is working hard to help promote these reforms and to educate folks about them and what the new deadlines are. Can you give us a little thumbnail about what the new uh, deadlines are in, in terms of someone who is seeking office. It's changed a lot about from even last year in terms of when they need to have their paperwork done. Absolutely, because of the of the consolidated primary. So it's it's you know going to be fast upon us. Uh, in February 26th is the first day for circulating and signing designated petitions. April 1st through 4th is the uh, open filing for designating petitions. April 8th is the last day to file authorization of designation of a candidate who is not an enrolled member of the party. Uh, and it's also the last day to file a certificate of acceptance or uh, declining uh, a designation. Um, and then there are other dates for people who want to run as, as independents and whatnot. Yeah, it's all on the Board of Elections uh, website. But, but yes, anybody thinking of running for office, this is all going to be upon you very quickly. <laughs> it is, it is. And particularly in um, local elections, they've got to get caucuses and that type of thing in for like towns and villages who use the caucus method. That all has to happen in a very short order. That's right, that's right. Those dates are all moved up too, so. Right, and so we encourage anyone who's interested in running for office at any level, please go visit the St. Lawrence County Board of Elections website. It is being updated co consistently and constantly with new information as it becomes available. And we're gonna put that website in our show notes so that you folks will be able to find it, hopefully, quite easily. So 
we've kind of run through the new um, election laws and the opportunities that are going to be here starting in 20, uh, 2019. But let's talk a little bit more about the league, Kathy, and how folks who are interested can support the work. So how does a person become a member? <laughs> well, um, you have to be a citizen. Um, and you have to be, well, as it, our bylaws now say um, 18 or older, but I think if, if we're pre-registering people, I think maybe 17 or 16 uh, will be able to, to join soon as well. Um, you can join online. <coughs> Excuse me, at our website or at the State League of Women Voters, or by contacting me. Um, and my contact information is on our website. And um, yeah, you know, the benefits of joining the league is, is you know, you're supporting the work of the league at the state and the national uh, level. And and we do we do a lot more than just voting reform work too, as you know, Donna. That's right. I mean, the league has positions on, on many issues. I mean, we could, because we believe an informed citizenry is very important, and there are many issues that you know, public officials are making decisions on. We have positions on you know, environmental protection, on um, women's issues, health care reform, uh, and, and um, just to name a few. And so they can, people can get more information about that uh, through our website as well. But uh, democracy is only as strong as, you know, the number of participants, and so we want everybody to participate. That's the point of the voting reform. But informed participation is what we need. So. And that really is the issue because a lot of the public policy uh, issues that we talk about are complicated and it does take some work to figure out what a good policy is and you have to educate yourself and it's more than just listening to the various talking heads on yes. cable news about what is actually consists of good policy uh, you cannot twitter your way to a policy very successfully can you no no so um so to get back for just a second the league is actually uh, although we're very happy about the voting reforms that have come in, there's still plenty more that can be done in that area, and it's not like our work is over, is it? No, 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 no rest. <laughs> no rest for the weary. <laughs> so, uh, any, um, any final thoughts about the League that you would like to share with folks? Well, um, you know, support the League. It is, uh, you know, it has a long, uh, illustrious history, I think, and, and one that we're trying to uh, keep going forward here, but we always uh, need members. And, um, you know, the, I think the work, this recent successes here sort of speak, you know, speak for themselves, but there's a lot more to, a lot more to do, so help us, join us, help us. And you might want to take just a second, Kathy, to tell people about the League's Observer Corps, because I think that's yes. a very critical part of keeping an eye on local government, isn't it? Very good point, yes. Um, the Observer Corps is something that um, local leagues uh, do. We are, we are rather small leagues, so we you know, haven't had a chance to do too much of it yet. But the idea is that public meetings should be attended by the public. And so we have uh, you know, um, members of the league wearing a button to identify themselves as members of the Observer Corps, um, attend meetings, I, in, introduce oneself to whoever is chairing the meetings, and then you watch and see how the meeting is conducted. Is it, is, you know, are there you know, sort of rules of order that are being followed? Was the agenda made available ahead of time? Are the notes available afterwards? Um, does the meeting convene and then immediately go into executive session? What are they talking about behind closed doors? Things like that. Um, and also, so that, uh, you know, we can report back to members about, you know, maybe issues that are coming up and urge people to attend, uh, but also to, you know, raise, uh, you know, alarms if, if meetings are not being conducted properly and openly. And, uh, and it just, it just, it's the sunshine effect, you know. <laughs> it is, and I think that the, um, uh, you mentioned um, going into executive session, that seems to be the most problematic for any any elected body is when it's appropriate to do that, when it's not appropriate to do that, and often it's not either well understood or it may be misused. And if you're not 
paying attention, it's very easy to misuse it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. And, and it's just a matter of ask, asking questions. There certainly are matters, you know, think personnel matters and whatnot, where mm -hmm. for, for privacy reading reasons, um, you know, you need to go into executive session. That's obviously, you know, needed. But when all of the, when, when decisions are all made, you know, instead of public discussion, you know, where the members of the public can hear some of the debate going on, everything is made behind closed doors, Mm, then, then you, you know, then you might be running into some problems. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, the um, League of Women Voters is 99 years old this day on Valentine's Day. So happy yes. birthday to yes. us! <laughs> uh, thank you, Kathy, for coming in today. This has been a very informative conversation. There's a lot going on in the field of voter reform in New York State and you know I think we've given people a good thumbnail sketch of what they can expect to happen this year so thank you. I hope so. Thank you for having me now. Well our pleasure. So our time is up. These conversations are a production of North Country Matters which is filmed here in the Fred W. Cleveland Computer Center of the Potsdam Public Library. The civic partners for this show are the League of Women Voters of St. Lawrence County and the Potsdam Public Library. Until next time remember our North Country Matters. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.